Hello. Welcome, everybody. My name is Damendra again, as I was saying earlier. Thank you for being patient with us. Uh, and welcome to um, a s part of the series of debates we're having about EU-Africa relations. Those of you connected just before the summer break or the summer lockdown, you'll know that we had Commissioner Uta uh, Upalainen and others in a very frank exchange, an interesting exchange about um, how we think about the future of EU-Africa relations. We have sub subsequently, and she announced it there, uh, that we'll be having a series of uh, debates, uh, debating Africa debates, where we'll bring commissioners from either side of the continent, if you like, uh, or, the, or, or the water, so commissioners from the EU and commissioners from Africa, to debate and discuss a whole range of topics. Today, as you can see from the programme, it's about building a greener, better recovery and future. What does that mean? What does that mean in real terms, in terms of people, money, investment, relations, and thinking about the future and the demographics of both in Europe, but also, more, most importantly, in Africa? We have today, uh, it's quite interesting, in, in a subject matter that's usually dominated by men, we have five women uh, who are powerful in their own right, who've done some amazing things in their own right, who are going to contribute and navigate and respond to this debate. I look forward to welcoming all of them in a moment, but I want to say to all of you, firstly, is that thank you for being here. So on the Zoom, you'll know if those of you are Zoom savvy, make sure you're, you stay mute. When, you, when I invite the audience to open up to a discussion, use your virtual hand, uh, which is where you'll find by the participants box, and you'll be able to put your hand up. Um, if you can't find it, let us know, send us a text, or send us a, uh, you know, use our uh, social media platform to let us know if you're having difficulties. Um, but let, you know, that's what you have to do to indicate that you're ac you want to speak or make a comment or ask a question. For those of you who are watching us on live stream, welcome and thank you also. Um, you can use our uh, uh, hashtag debating Africa EU. Uh, uh, for your comments or questions, and we will scoop them up and then post them to the qu post them to the speakers. We have only an hour, ladies and gentlemen, so this is going to be a choppy debate, but a, an important one. And I suppose I want to err on the side of making sure that you, as an audience participants watching, get the maximum opportunity to engage with this very powerful group of women who are involved in various ways in shaping um, uh, EU-Africa relations in their own way. So, uh, what I'd like to do first of all is invite Commissioner Uta Urpelainen. Uta? Hello. Hi. Good Hi. To see you. Good to see you again. You're looking extremely <laughs> well. I have to say, you've had a good summer, I imagine. I shouldn't say it that way, but you know what I mean. But you look great. Uh, lovely to see you. Um, please, um, a few words. Uh, uh, of uh, introduction for this because obviously we spoke at length last time and it was quite an energetic discussion if you recall and it's good that we've it was good and so I think you've taken up some of the issues that were raised in that debate but I think one of most importantly is to actually the commitment from both the EU and Africa to have these debates um, and for them to I suppose the most important thing for us and yourselves and those who are watching is that the target for these debates is the EU Africa summit obviously. And these discussions are about picking up the, the views, the voices and the perspectives and experiences of African stakeholders in particular. So uh, say a few words by way of introduction about how this will happen. Yeah. First of all, it's great to be here again. Thank you. And it's great to continue our, uh, our debates on, on EU-Africa uh, partnership. And as you know, we adopted a new Africa strategy uh, in March, just before the COVID hit, uh, so to say. And now, of course, uh, through this dialogue, we want to get reflections uh, from different stakeholders, uh, from the business uh, representatives, from the young people, from the civil society organizations, in order to prepare a joint political statement to be adopted in the African Union, European Union summit. Hopefully uh, in this autumn, uh, but I think in the coming coming weeks, uh, we will get more information about the date. Anyway, I would say uh, that um, Africa's uh, vulnerability to climate change and uh, in environmental degradation is alarming. As a closest neighbor, uh, we have a responsibility and also interest in Europe to address this challenge together. 
GDP exposure in African nations vulnerable to extreme climate pattern, patterns is projected to grow to about 1.4 trillion euro or dollar in 2023, nearly half of the continent's GDP. So the cost of inaction is greater than action. Currently, the whole world is grappling uh, with the COVID-19 crisis, unfortunately. In many countries in Africa, the COVID-19 pandemic has wiped away progress of recent years. For the first time since 1998, poverty is on the rise. The pandemic could push between 26 million to 39 million more people in poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. This is not the legacy we want to leave for the youth. I am proud of our Team Europe response in Africa. We have collect collectively with our member states as Team Europe allocated uh, 7 billion euros in support to Africa. But of course, our work is not done. We must learn important lessons from this pandemic. So we have to turn to green transition into a vibrant green economy through Africa's huge potential. As outlined in our strategy with Africa, a green transition in Africa will both increase our resilience across the globe, as well as provide a wealth of opportunities. So of course, I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you today how you think we can face this challenge together. And especially, I'm very happy uh, that I have my dear colleague, uh, Commissioner Katrin Simpson, but also my dear friends and colleagues uh, from the African Union to participate in our debate today. Over to you. you thank you very much. And I said, I, I, I know I keep on banging on about this, but I think it is significant that we have five women here. And it's a, there's an issue about how um, women of power can actually collaborate and do things differently and better than, unfortunately, some men. But, you know, we'll come back to that in a moment. But well, the issue for me is that, and I, I want to bring you in, I want you to think about this, is that specifically, I think all of you commissioners need to think about how does this process and how can it benefit the, both the agenda and the content of the AU Africa, you know, EU Africa Summit that's taking place the autumn date withstanding, but I think it's important for those people who are watching and listening to know that actually their voices will be and experiences and uh, uh, approaches will be taken into account. On that note, so I will come back to you, but thank you very much for that. Um, I want to move on to uh, um, Commissioner Josefa Sacco. Uh, Josefa, can you hear me? Josefa? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. 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 Good afternoon, a very warm welcome to you. Um, you are Commissioner for uh, Rural Economy and Agriculture. Tell us, what do you think needs to happen? How can EU Africa work together in the context where we find ourselves on a kind of, uh, not aggressive, but an effective and sustainable green transition? When we think about uh, the, you know, the food systems, we think about by, you know, uh, food security and, and you know, the, the green ecology. What do you think um, we need to do? How can, how can EU Africa work together on this more effectively? Over to you, Josefa. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving me the floor. Good afternoon, Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, and ladies and gentlemen. Let me thank the organizer for extending an invitation to the commission to participate on the debate regarding the green transition and energy access. Africa remains the most vulnerable uh, uh, of the continent, especially on climate change. So the, with the event of uh, COVID-19 as uh, further on the, on the line, it's uh, our vulnerability and to do additional uh, problems in efforts to achieve the goals of our regional development target, which is our agenda 2063, and as well as our global agenda, the SDG 2030. The post-pandemic recovery process uh, 
presents an opportunity, as the previous speaker, my colleague, the commissioner said, uh, an opportunity for the green transition for countries to build back better through investing in a more environmentally friendly uh, and sustainable and resilient economy and also responsible at the African Union for the environment and the commissioner of the environment per se. However, it will need to be aligned in principle of a just transition, a green transition which takes into account historical responsibility for issues like climate change and a transition that does not push already disadvantaged and marginalized community deeper into poverty and more vulnerability. We want a clear type of deal or program that it will be a win-win program okay. both from the North and the South. Africa's ra rapid economic uh, development, urbanization, and effort for inclusive growth generates a daunting energy challenges combined with rising expectation of uh, environmental sustainability and enhanced resilience. A, su a sustainable way to meet uh, growing energy needs is one of the fundamental development challenge for African continent. We all know that we have a lot of challenges in this area. Access to energy is a key driver for a inclusive growth as uh, it helps the, uh, to unlock economic uh, potential, job creation, attainment of Agenda 26, uh, 2030, on sustainable development goal, agriculture, water, environment, health, and education. A green transition, if well implemented, will produce the double, the double benefit of the environment while also ensuring economic development through multiplier effects such as job creation. One such investment is on renewable energy and we have the potential to really go through renewable energy in africa irena statistics indicates that every one uh, one million uh, us dollar invested in clean energy can create 25 jobs and with more ambition and putting clear energy at the heart of uh, recovery in africa the clean energy action could have the potential to create up to 5 million decent jobs in Africa. We are really keen <laughs> on really also giving okay. the opportunity because the unemployment in Africa is too much. Absolutely, absolutely. Can I still, I'm about to finish. Can okay, of course. The, yeah, absolutely, Commissioner, sure. Okay, so we want really to, to have a clean energy, but mm. also a job opportunity for our youth instead of them to come to cross the Mediterranean and, and cross another problem Indeed. in Europe. So that is why we are really keen on the, you know, finding other sources, sources of employment mm. for our use. Climate change remains an important issue and must remain on the global agenda. This year, 2020, parties of uh, UNFCCCC con convention are expected to submit ambitious natural uh, and nationally determined contribution to keep global temperature in, uh, increased below two, uh, two degrees Celsius or 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. Looking ahead, COP's, uh, COP26 provides an opportunity for countries to renew and enhance climate ambition and action. I commend efforts of the African Union member states, UNSEN, and the EU and other relevant stakeholders and partners on the development of green recovery plan and stimulus package under the umbrella of the green transition. This strategy and plan need to be converted from strategy and translated into action. Such plan could, should also include providing support to strengthen a existing initiative on climate change, such as those under the African Climate Commission, the renewable energy, tourism, biodiversity, and natural conservation. My department and the Department of Infrastructure and uh, Energy are already 
engaging in some of the priority intervention for green recovery, including issues of uh, waste management and uh, the circular uh, economy, conserving uh, biodiversity and combating illegal wildlife uh, trade, combating <coughs> land degradation, desertification, and drought, enhancing climate action, investing in blue economy, scaling up uh, uh, climate smart agriculture and food security, and investing in renewable energy okay. that all is needed, uh, all that is needed is resource to concept into full operation. A green transition for Africa will require finance, capacity building, and all the means of implementation. The lack of adequate and predictable fund has been the tumbling uh, block to the implementation of climate action. With COVID-19, the situation will be worse as it has been focused on responding to the pandemic. Countries will need to mobilize resources from both public and uh, public and private sector, okay. as well as from bilateral and multi multilateral partners. We will count on uh, we will count uh, on uh, the EU as our natural partner to offer such support we need it, when we need. Thank, thank you, you Josefa. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, only, I, I was only trying to intervene because I, I, I know that uh, we have very little time, and I know a lot of people that are watching, both in the Zoom and the live stream, will want to engage. So we have to make space to make sure that they get the opportunity to interact. But thank you very much for your contribution. And I think the interesting thing will be to bring back into the conversation what do those words mean in practice? What is it you actually need? Uh, from EU? What do we need within African states? And what are the kind of um, practical steps that need to happen to take this forward? On that note, um, I'm very pleased to move, uh, continue on, on, on the side of Africa and invite Commissioner Amani. Uh, Amani, are you there? Hello? Yes, I'm there. Hello, Ram. A very you? warm welcome to you as well. You're looking very well as well. Um, obviously, all of you are doing really well. Um, we spoke yesterday, but as you said, um, you, you, you know, you're involved in infrastructure and energy. Um, and, you know, you have a huge, huge portfolio. Um, we find ourselves in a time of uh, as incredible crisis, a, a crisis we've never experienced before. Yet... Um, communities are going to almost have to double down on their experiences up to now. The virus has only exposed the heightened levels of inequalities, uh, both in Africa and Europe and elsewhere. In that context, you know, instead of resetting the relationship between the EU and Africa, um, how do we build back better? What do you think needs to happen? Over to you, Armani. Uh, thank you very much, Ram. Uh, first of all, delighted to uh, join you again and to uh, be among this uh, uh, distinguished panel. But let me just uh, rephrase what you just said, because we are not resetting the EU-AU uh, uh, relationship or partnership. Uh, resetting, I'm an engineer, so when you reset means you stop and you start again. Our partnership is uh, an old partnership, and it's also the closest partnership, and it's dynamic. So the word, it's a dynamic partnership that, uh, uh, so we are uh, constantly uh, reviewing, revising our priorities and our actions in a way that also uh, uh, is coping with the circumstances and is also addressing the needs and uh, uh, to deliver on the aspirations of both our uh, continent. So just uh, on the resetting part. But uh, to your question, and of course, I mean, uh, as a follow-up to what was said before by uh, the two distinguished uh, commissioners, the, our immediate imperative now, of course, whether in Africa or even in Europe, by the way, is to keep start inclusive economic growth. Uh, we need to restore confidence and attract investment and allow people to uh, and markets to function again. And in that sense, when we do that, implementing infrastructure projects uh, uh, can uh, lead and uh, they lead to uh, uh, near-term employment gains. And then, of course, this supports inclusive growth, resilience and recovery. But having said what I said earlier and how turning this crisis into an opportunity, because it is indeed an opportunity, uh, it's also an opportunity for us and Europe we're working together is to uh, 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 rethink and uh, reimagine the, the way we are doing our work and or re-emphasizing, uh, prioritizing the priorities, if you will. I see three pillars for that. Okay. 
uh, uh, one is the acceleration of energy access and transition. Uh, and in that sense, uh, uh, increase in access to electricity through on-grid, off-grid, renewable energy uh, represent a major opportunity in the context of recovery programs. Uh, uh, we are helped by, you know, the, the amazing technologies, uh, especially the digital ones in, uh, that are in continually, uh, continuously coming to the market, and they can help us a lot in, in creating these uh, uh, or scaling up uh, an energy uh, transition consistently, of course, with uh, uh, resilience and uh, 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 and uh, you know uh, an inclusive growth we do have of course uh, larger ones larger initiatives like uh, the the programs uh, regional and continental uh, for renewable energy and the feeder program we need to then fast track the ones uh, on energy that deliver in rural areas in health facilities in, in education facilities uh, 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 to as a as a as a as a resilience measure and then continue in that on that path uh, renewable energy programs uh, for a lot medium and longer term. Uh, the second aspect we were is, is still talking about energy here is efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, we seem to forget about efficiency. It's not just about using the renewable energy, but using the energy that we have efficiently. And here I have been calling uh, because very often, yes, we do have problems with the transmission lines that are not efficient or the machines that we use that they are not efficient. People seem to forget that these machines are, in, I mean, they are sent to Africa. <laughs> Ones that are not efficient are yes, sent to Africa. Indeed. So on both sides, mm. we have a big duty in mm. making sure that whatever comes to Africa is also energy efficient and uh, uh, abides and follows the rules that are uh, European or the best way, uh, 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 the best uh, efficient standards uh, uh, and energy standards. And uh, for that, uh, 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 we, we do have a, a program, a, a, a commission, I mean, for energy efficiency. And I do really invite our European partners to closely work with us on the energy efficiency. The third is clean cooking. And I have, I cannot emphasize it enough. I need people to remember that 90% of the, uh, uh, the, the fuel for cooking used in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, even though I don't like to use Sub-Saharan, the term Sub-Saharan Africa, because we are one continent, uh, except that the, the, the statistics available are like this. Anyway, 90% of this energy is, uh, is firewood and coal. It's unacceptable. Yeah. Unacceptable in this day and age. So... Uh, I can go on on for energy, but uh, for the sake of time, I will uh, I, I will uh, leave that here, and then I can come back to any of these elements later on. The second mm. pillar is transport, mm. greening our transport systems, and already we are engaged uh, uh, in Africa and engaging with the ICAO, the the UN Agency for Civil Aviation, uh, in for the greenhouse. I mean, to limit the greenhouse effect of aviation, and also to use the opportunity opportunity of what's happening now in the in the sector of civil aviation to rethinking in a way you know to uh, 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 that that to reduce the, the emissions from from aviation but we are also very happy that across the continent our countries already started programs for alternative fuels for cars we are uh, 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 as you heard from commissioner uh, Josefa we are urbanizing very fast when i make sure that our air uh, uh, it gets cleaner. And uh, already I, ha I hear of two or three or more factories that are converting cars e either by the, to the use of the gas or the use of electricity. Uh, I mean, gas, uh, natural gas rather than uh, uh, petrol. Uh, uh, and, and we do have programs in that sense. Third, the mm. game changer is digitalization. Of course. I'm and glad you came to that. That's, good. The, game, that's the game. Governance or e uh, government services means that you don't use transport systems anymore. E education, uh, uh, e health, and you name it. Tra Digital is giving us a fantastic opportunity for okay. not only it's better, greener, smarter, near future. It's not even doesn't. It's not even far. I mean, we we made. We are this far. Uh, uh, into digitalizing our lives in only it took us three weeks three weeks the world turned digital imagine what we can do in months I'll Excellent. stop here. I have a lot to say. But I know I you do, Armani. I, I, I hate to stop you, but I love what you just said there because it, it demonstrates that where there's a will, there's a way. 
And often politics, economi eco economics, and vested interest really does get in the way sometimes. But I think you're, what you're all signaling is that you can do things differently and better. Um, listen, I, we have two more speakers. We have Kadri, a uh, commissioner in the EU, and then we have Damilola, who is CEO of c for all um, Sustainable Energy for All. I'll bring you both in in a moment, but I really want to be able to just get a quick fire reaction if there's a desire from the Zoom audience or our live streamers, if there's a reaction to what you've heard so far, because I know that you've been listening intently. And some of you have raised questions about, you know, uh, um, the reference to resetting. What I meant was about the relationship, not the strategy. It's about actually how do you make sure there's greater trust, greater power, sharing, etc. In, in that, rather than actually the changing of the strategy per se. We know there's a strategy out there, and we know there's a road to travel before we get to the EU Africa Summit. Uh, but over to you. Hands up virtually if you're wishing to ask a question or even just react to what you've heard to. Anybody out there? I know I can see your faces, obviously. Um, Lydia, Lydia, yourself, where are you? Um, hello. Hi. Wondering. Thank you so much. Please, um, my, just very briefly, briefly you. introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Lydia Machaga, and I work for uh, SITSE. And... Um, I do have a, a question. I think it's an overall question. And thank you so much for the presentations that have been made so far. I think maybe this is a general comment to all the speakers that's okay. a question that is all the speakers that have spoken, because I had a lot of reference made to resetting uh -huh. uh, the partnership. So uh, is this new strategy um, meant to replace the previous joint uh, uh, okay. strategy all right. that has been previously made since uh, long ago 2007 or 8. Okay and where are you by the way right now you've got a wonderful backdrop. Thank you I'm currently based in South Africa. Lovely. Well, thank you for joining us and we'll get the question answered. I think I, it's my fault for using the word resetting, but we'll ask the commissioner uh, as to answer. We now have also Yosef. Yosef, are you there? Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Have you disappeared? Yeah. Ah. Yes, uh, I'm there. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for giving me the power. Not at all. Say where you're from and who you are. Yeah, I'm Yusuf Ali. I'm a social entrepreneur. So uh, we are based in Chad. So uh, the founder and CEO of Kuran Jabo. We are distributing energy for, for low-income individuals and, uh, and, and households in Central Africa. And currently we are based in Chad. So uh, my question is, uh, there is all this global strategy between uh, Africa and the UAE. Uh, and, and about you know how to to make Africa green and how to to make it to go fast. Uh -huh. But as an entrepreneur, that we are in the ground, we see things going slowly, uh, and that's uh, and, and and to promote renewable energy uh, in, in countries like Central Africa need massive investment, uh, which is currently is not available for entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs like us. So, what are the strategy that you think about it and, and how it's going to be uh, is going to be in the ground for the people like us who are promoting uh, all this and putting all this effort in energy? Yusuf, you no, but Yusuf, before you go, you are an entrepreneur on the ground. You've just said you've got the ear of five commissioners. What is it you'd like? What do you need? You, is it just money? Or is it something yeah, else? For, for, yeah, uh, the money and the support because entrepreneurs, they have that ability and, uh, and, uh, and capacity to innovate and to bring, you know, a real solution that uh, can meet, you know, uh, the needs in the ground. So we don't need to support, you know, uh, equipment from Europe. But the money doesn't exist. It doesn't like come to the entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs and innovators. So what's the policy? What's the strategy? Okay, great. We'll, well, we've got people speaking off, uh, in a moment to respond to that. Um, we'll go to um, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sarah Mbagobunu, and I'm the regional director for IFAD, based out of Rome. Uh -huh. um, for Eastern Southern Africa. Lovely. So my question, and I just want to thank the commissioners, uh, particularly uh, Madame Sacco, with my uh, commissioner. Um, we have the African Free Trade Area, which is an opportunity. All African governments have convened around that. And uh, the analysis suggests that 30 million people can be moved out of poverty if all these trade barriers can be removed. How can we integrate that opportunity, that momentum that 54 African, 55 African states are interested in? Uh, and how can the EU support 
uh, African states in the EU to uh, achieve that ambition. And I think the EU has had such good experience with the European Union, mm -hmm. their pioneers in bring, building up these economic blocks. Mm -hmm. In order for this to happen, we would need to be able to you know, implement the treaties, countries would need to have the capacities to comply, uh, treaty administration, etc. cetera. Um, I, I would just like to hear from the commissioners exactly how, how do we think- Yeah, <laughs> how do we create an internal, free internal market in Africa? Okay, and are you hopeful yeah. about that, Sarah? Do you think I, it's possible? I'm very hopeful about that, and I just want to build up on uh, basically the previous speaker, the young man, the entrepreneur. Okay. Agri SMEs actually provide 80% of the services to rural, to rural farmers. They're actually the main off takers. They provide sorting. They actually do trade services, etc. We actually need to be able to come up with innovative finance to de risk mm -hmm. and work with financial institutions in country to provide the finance that is required. I think. The basic infrastructure is there. There okay. is financial markets, they're working. How can we also deepen and crowd in green finance for that? Mm. IFAD is working hand in okay. hand to do that. And uh, what we have seen is the transaction cost for mobilizing that green finance is very challenging. And the pipeline for green financing is blocked. It's too small, it's not coming through enough. Okay. So, so, so those capacity constraints is what we need to really focus on and unblock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I, um, and let's see what our, our, our fellow colleagues in the Commission and uh, the Commissioners have to say about that. That's a very specific, very specific idea from this debate about how do you create a broader, more effective green finance pipeline for agri, but also a whole range of other transition and energy issues. On this note, I'm going to go to Kadri. Kadri, thank you for being so patient. And colleagues, those who've asked questions, we will come back to those, uh, those questions from the Commissioners. Can I, um, I can't see you at the moment. Where are you? Hello. Yes, good afternoon from Brussels. Hi, good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Good. Thank you for joining us. Um, you've heard, uh, obviously, what, what your colleagues have said, from both within the EU, but also in Africa. Um, and you've heard some of the qu questions that are being raised by uh, our, our, our audience here. From, from your perspective, as the Commissioner for Energy, you've just heard that part of the energy conundrum, conundrum is both the need to transition to green, but also energy ac access, which is sustainable. You've heard from some, some people on the ground that actually we need better um, investment startup approaches, but also sustainable finance over time. How, what, say us a little bit about what you think are the issues in the context of us moving towards the EU-AU the EU -AU, uh, summit and how you and colleagues in the Europe team are going to respond to the challenges that we've just heard about. Over to you, Kadri. Thank you. And well, just to well, uh, start, I would like to reflect that, um, um, to that uh, topic that Amani ended her intervention. This was digitalization. Mm. So uh, I'm coming uh, from northern part of uh, Europe, from Estonia. Yes. And, yes. Um, and uh, we do almost everything digitally, even digital. before the COVID crisis. And I can, uh, I can um, confirm that uh, doing things digitally, it saves a lot of time and money for companies and for private persons. So definitely this is one of the pillars around what we should uh, build our recovery plans. Uh, another one is green transition. And this is so here in um, European Union, um, but we truly hope that our good partners uh, will uh, find the similar um, ways and in our last college to college meeting in February this year, um, between then European uh, uh, Commission and African Union Commission, we agreed on a common objective that uh, the pursuit of sustainable development through a low carbon, climate resilient and green growth. And shortly after, they, after that, uh, you may know that the European Commission also adopted um, uh, our strengthened strategy with Africa. And today's discussion is an important uh, opportunity to discuss, and uh, I do agree um, uh, to discuss how this green energy initiative um, can be uh, implemented as a part of strategy with Africa. And um, we have been intensively working um, with this strategy uh, during past months, and I believe this initiative will be a game changer in the relations between uh, the two continents as it will top up our development data efforts um, with the potential of the private sector in order to support universal access to sustainable energy. Because uh, we all know that most important 
issue for Africans in energy sector, it is the access mm -hmm. to electricity. Um, so uh, Amani already mentioned that uh, there are um, almost 600 million people still lacking either access or basic services, um, or they do have unreliable access. And the European Union has been supporting our African partners in this issue and we definitely will continue to do so. Okay. So um, for us, from our perspe perspective, the African continent um, holds a very high renewable energy potential. Um, this, is, um, this should be a solution for African nations um, to bring clean and also cost-effective and local and reliable energy services to citizens and, um, and at the same time giving more attention to clean cooking solutions. This will be also very important. And it is clear to us that uh, investments in these areas will not come uh, without an appropriate uh, regulatory framework. So concrete measures need to be taken. Um, and uh, this, this is um, the area where we can share our experience uh, with Africa. And one complemented, uh, well, one complicated issue that you have to solve is also that you have found that many, many uh, uh, countries in Africa, um, they are devel developing and discovering the um, natural gas. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. if it helps to well, uh, phase out more polluting sources, and um, this is um, um, a good um, chance for, uh, for Africans. Um, for us, it is also very important that, um, that uh, we should keep in mind the energy efficiency principle because the cheapest mm -hmm. energy is that we don't need to use. And according to IEA, International Energy Agency's uh, um, analysis, it is uh, possible to multiply the African economy uh, by four, by 2040, so within 20 years, two decades. Um, but only if we are keeping the rise of energy demand under 50%. And this will not be possible without um, important energy efficiency gains. So okay. um, energy efficiency first principle is a, a good principle how you can do the same things, but um, just uh, wasting less. And, uh, and um, if we are talking about uh, investments into a renewable energy sector, this was also one question then, um, then um, we should uh, both uh, here in Europe and also in African continent uh, uh, do so as a response to COVID crisis. And again, I have to refer to uh, International Energy Agency's research, um, uh, World Energy Investment 2020. Um, um, energy investment is set to fall by one fifth in 2020 due to the COVID pandemic. Okay. And at the same time, uh, we know that uh, there are more uh, vulnerable regions that will most probably lose more if we don't react. Indeed. So, um, Indeed. Okay. From our point of view, there are dedicated funds from our side, but yes. we can't achieve what we are um, willing without private investment. Indeed. Kadri, thank you. For that. And I'm sorry to rush you because I know that um, I want to uh, bring in Damilola quickly because I know Damilola is going to have to leave very shortly. But hold on to some of those thoughts. I think that if you reflect on what... Amani said about, and she didn't actually name it as this, but the, the fact that, you know, millions of people are continue to use wood and coal, and there's a gender issue there about who has to who be, be placed the responsibility on, unfortunately, around this. But I'm going to move to Damilola straight away. Damilola, welcome. Hello, how are you today? Hello, how are you? Good I'm to, very well, thank good you. Good to see you again. Again, blooming. It's lovely. Um, <laughs> I know that you need to you need to dash, Dami Lola, but um, tell me um, what you've heard from people in the audience, and you've heard what the commissioner said. Um, what do we? What needs? What do African governments need for sustainable energy transition and sustainable energy per se? Okay, so um, again, thank you for having me back here again, and it's really refreshing what we've been hearing with mm -hmm. the commissioners. I totally agree. Um, with the digitalization conversation mm -hmm. and also the green transition. But then we need to be practical. Obviously, I, I come from the country level, even though I'm now heading an international organization, and you're not going to achieve digitalization without sustainable energy. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so those are one key facts. And you still have in a continent in terms of energy access where you have 565 million people that don't have access and 900 million people that don't have access to clean cooking. We are really at crisis point. So it's important when we talk and have these discussions, we need to put the scale and the urgency into play, especially when clean cooking is also representation for a lot of gender-based violence that we see on the continent. But if we just move into real kind of real issues, the first issue is financing. Um, It's not that there is not enough financing, Mm -hmm. there is financing, but it's so hard to attract financing. I ran the largest energy access program with the World Bank and AFDB, and that was only 550 million. And the time it took to access that financing and the effort it took, I always I always put it to kind of giving birth to a child. It is it is very, very difficult <laughs> okay. for a country. Jamie, no, no, for, for you, we, uh, how long did it yes. take? How long did it take? It, it, it took about 24 months, which was record time, but it's just the intensity of everything that had to go into it and how big the team used to had to be. And this is right. after passing laws, after yeah. passing policies. But the truth is climate financing is very, very hard to target. And if we still are working in a, in a global economy where it's easier to get financing for fossil than green, it would be we're, yeah. we're just we're just losing out. So I would really like us to to really target that in these relationships. And Damilo, the before other, you move, Damilo, before you move on, is that for yeah. the EU and the African governments, or is that just targeted the EU? It's that actually comment. targeted to, to, to the EU okay. in terms of Fine. if if government do pass all the all the different conditions, how do they actually access the funds, right? Okay. And to have clear terms to access funds, because I think that will go a long way for African governments to see. Am I going to get involved in this or am I not? Because again, you cannot, the energy transition conversation is an energy access conversation for Africa. There's just no way you can separate it. Okay. The second point that I think is important is not to look at Africa as just one country. Sure. Um, the African context, they are different types of strategies. So in the EU strategy, it's really important to realize that the challenges in Nigeria will be different to Egypt, to be different to Botswana, to be different to Somalia. And country specific um, interventions are always needed and what is the green what is the energy transition pathway for Africa there's actually there's there's no document or determination per country to say this is how we get to net zero by 2050 and those things are really important and then I guess I still have two more comments Um, the next one is the is the role of gender Like we cannot shy away from it. And the statistics are showing us in my country, Nigeria, jobs that are that are female based or female ran in sustainable decentralized energy are 23 times more productive. So the data is even showing that we should move more into it. But there's still a a lack of training of young African women Mm -hmm. um, into decentralized energy. So if we're trying to say that we are trying to fulfill a gap and this gap is a 28 billion dollar problem every Mm -hmm. single year. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to create at least you know 1.2 to 1.3 million jobs every single year we should be thinking about capacity building and we should also be thinking about the youth very strongly because they're the ones who are going to do the work okay and then finally because i know we're running out of time is is it's just the fact that we can't do this alone and we have to build momentum with with different organizations um if i put my un hat back on there's going to be a high level dialogue on energy next year 2021 20, um, at the general assembly and i would look really look forward to working with the eu on how we we promote energy and how we you know we promote energy access and then there's also uh cop 27 is also an african cop um so it's uh, just some very, very big moments that we can we can Damilola, all work for. Thank you. And I think you've given us lots in terms of very practical things about make the financial pipeline much more clearer, easier, and not such, as you say, like giving birth. The second thing is that, you know, and we'll have to think about this as a, a, in the Africa-EU alliance, is that how do you support each member state or each country uh, to have its own green pathway, transitions pathway, which I think is a really interesting point, so that you actually are able to create some sort of uh, jigsaw puzzle that fits as you move forward. And obviously that point about gender uh, and youth, we need to really focus on. Thank you very much, Damilola. I'm sure, I'm, I'm not sure if you're having to leave or whether you'll be staying for questions, but I'm gonna bring in some of our, audio, our, our viewers. Vince, you've been patient. Vince, where are you? Hello. 
You need to unmute yourself. Ah, there you go. Okay, so Say, done the trick. Hi. Great. Introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from. What do you do? So I'm Vince Chadwick. I'm the Brussels correspondent for DevEx. Um, and I put a question for Commissioner Erpelainen um, about the European um, Court of Auditors report into um, EU aid to Kenya, which was released this week, um, which really shone a spotlight on the idea of these three focal sectors in national indicative programs um, and seemed to suggest, and this is from the press release, that spreading funding over so many areas increases the risk of not reaching the necessary critical mass to achieve significant results in any single sector. So I wanted to ask you your perspective on this question on whether the EU is not spreading itself too thin and how you might uh, be changing that approach in the next uh, programming cycle. Vince, which is thank now you, but all, thank you. But also, I think Damilola's point is obviously well made. She made that point about money and how hard it is to get that money. So there's that point about admin, but also about spreading too thin. Uh, and I'll come. I'll bring you, uh, Yuta. I'll bring you in in a moment. Rachel, we have next. Thank you for your question, Rachel. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks very much. Hello. Hi, I'm. Um... Yeah, I'm speaking from Brussels, from Climate Action Network Europe, which okay. is a network of climate energy development NGOs. Um, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point that um, uh, a lot of the discussion so far has focused on energy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was very pleased to um, see that Commissioner Sarko was speaking. So bringing it back to a bit to her intervention, um, and also, as mentioned by Commissioner Apolina, and the... Um, the vulnerability of the continent, the costs of inaction. What is the partnership strategy um, going to su support by way of adaptation initiatives, perhaps African-led adaptation initiatives, such as the African Adaptation Initiative? Um, um, and who's and that, what who's is that question to? Is that to well? To I think it would be best placed to Commissioner Erpelainen and okay. Commissioner Sarko. Okay, fine. And to uh, ensure that all them. Um, everything that the uh, strategy supports is kind of adaptation proof and resilient that it's not okay. going to be vulnerable to climate impacts. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that, Rachel. Um, I'm going to go to Chibuna. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Nigeria. You're in Nigeria yeah, right my, now? Yes, my name is Chibuna Wuna. I'm from Student Energy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working as the global Youth Energy Outlook Regional Coordinator for Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh -huh. My question is, um, how can we bring young people from both continents together to deliberate, collaborate, and form relationships that will be sustainable for the long term in order to foster progressive Africa-Europe partnership? It is, and do, would you, what kind of thing are you looking for? Because that's the great, everyone talks about this, right? Don't they? That, you know, we need to have collaboration. We need to get young people from either side. And somehow we just don't pull it off. What would you like to see? Um, well, going forward for the AU, uh, AU Africa, um, AU EU Summit, I would love um, young people from both continents to come together to, to share there. Mm -hmm. their ideas. It has to be there together because by the time we start building these um, relationships with the young people, they will foster friendships that will last for a long time and um, the partnerships will really, really um, work in, because of those relationships that are formed. So that's my perspective on that. Chibuna, thank you very much. And let's hope we, you're able to be at the summit later on this year because what you're raising is, a con is a many, many young people in our conversation with Uta and others uh, just before the summer made the same point that we need to have uh, not uh, as bystanders but actually part of the summit process. We only have about 10 minutes left, right, colleagues? I'm going to take one more contributor, Jane, and then I'm going to turn to all the commissioners. So, Jane, where are you? Hey, you can hear me. With a little uh, dist ah, there you go. Hello, welcome, Jane. Yes, my name is Jane. I'm uh, calling from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. I work ah. for the United Nations Environment Program. Welcome. Um, in the Air Quality and Mobility Unit. So mine is we actually have a, lot a of, comment. We have, one second, Jane. We have a lot of blowback on your on your volume for some reason. Perhaps you want to move back a bit. And uh, but anyway, carry on. Let's let's see if we can survive. That's it. Go on. Go for it. That's okay. Okay. That's better. Yes. Okay. So mine is actually just a comment uh, that there is. Um, uh, thank you for the presenters. They talked about like uh, Dr. Mani on the three pillars, 
Um, but we need to also look at how to integrate uh, this approach. For example, in the transport, uh, you can talk about energy efficiency, digitalization, uh, the need to have cleaner fuels, and that's and we already have programs that the EU is already um, collaborating with Africa. So we need to build up on some of these uh, initiatives and examples, and also uh, have sessions for lessons sharing. So mine is just a comment that there is already some work ongoing. Yeah. How can we build uh, on this uh, ongoing work? Thank you. What would you like to see happen, Jane? So you you say that's happening, but and we need to build on it. So who takes the lead? Yes. For example, like uh, currently we see that the EU, uh, a lot of the countries uh, uh, have incentivized electric mobility. Okay. So it's something that we already started to build uh, in Africa because of, you know, it has renewable energy, uh, it creates job opportunities. How do we finance such things? Uh, so that's something that we are looking at specifically, renewable uh, electric mobility. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. Now, and I'm sorry, co colleagues, that I'm not be able to take many more uh, Graham, contributions. Can I jump in for this last uh, on this last comment, and then maybe take it from there? I was going, <laughs> Amani. I was just about to invite you. I was going to say I'm going to invite the commissioners now <laughs> to okay. make their remarks so in response. What do we need response. to do on the on. In existing initiatives? And thank you very much, Jane, to remind us that there are lots of existing initiatives. We need to take them to scale. So they cannot, we cannot continue or accept, you know, the uh, uh, piloting or small, you know, take them to scale and fast to bring in the private sector, especially the SMEs. And here, uh, uh, when we talk about the SMEs, the element of finance will, will come in. Three, I mean, link that up. And uh, it may not have been clear in my intervention. When I say smart, sustainable and, uh, and uh, uh, climate resilient, I meant it across the board. Each and every sector, each and every initiative has to be uh, gender sensitive, smart, uh, uh, and resilient. And uh, someone asked about the uh, free trade area. Free trade area, a fantastic opportunity. Again, it needs infrastructure. Of course, it's a prerequisite for it to function, but it also going to catalyze infrastructure, especially the regional and continental ones, because we need uh, uh, intercontinental and cross continental roads, airports. Uh, um, energy digitalization, digital IDs with, with common uh, 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 criteria, we need e-commerce and so on and so forth. So uh, the idea okay. here is that we are facing a crisis that can turn in, into opportunity by rethinking and using the new technologies, using the, ener the energies in both the public and private sector, especially the young people and women, and take it to scale. And I think Okay, but uh, Mani, before you go, but I need you to be brief though. You've made a lot of statements there about it, this needs to happen, that needs to happen. Who does it? So people are going to say these are wise, these are great words, but who's going to take the lead? Who should be taking the lead? We, we are taking the lead when it comes to Africa. The African Union takes the lead when it comes to policies. We have the African Development Bank okay. that has what, yeah, lots of you know, programs uh, in place. The private sector, the African private sector is providing just one without, I'm not going to make any publicity here. There was one entrepreneur that is providing 100,000 grants for young people, you know, to do uh, innovative uh, uh, enterprises. So there is a lot of uh, uh, movement okay. across the continent. And uh, let me just say that uh, youth uh, have always been an integral part of EU, EU summits, and they are going to be also an integral part of the coming one. Thank you. Are they? Because what we heard before was they didn't feel that. So it's, we'll, we'll hold you to account on that, all the commissioners here, that actually the young people that vo voiced their concerns last time and today, that they will hold you to the fact that you're saying they will be integral and not bystanders and not just for show and consultation. Okay, um, Josefa, I'm going to come to you if I may. And just very briefly, if you can respond to that very specific point about adaptation. Josefa, are you still there? Have we lost you? Okay. I was muted. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, concerning adaptation, uh, our uh, in Africa, our position is very, very clear. Our priority uh, in our NDCs is, I can say, 90% of actions are action on adaptation. But the only issue that we have, and somebody raised it, is the problem of climate fi uh, financing. 
it's really, really a challenge. Okay. Because we had, you know, we developed our NDCs, we submitted it for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Uh, up to today, access to as, uh, access to this uh, uh, to to, uh, to uh, finance is really, really, really uh, a, a bottleneck for 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 the continent. So we really need to mobilize a lot on. Uh, uh, the African Union has been uh, providing training uh, to national uh, uh, focal points for NDC to enhance implementation. Mm. Uh, we also want the developing continent, uh, you know, to we have a climate uh, climate change strategy and we have action plan for circular economy. We even have uh, a big support from uh, the uh, Royal of uh, Morocco. Okay. On, uh, on adaptation the three A's. so we have all these initiatives yeah but we need to mobilize enough a lot fund like as i said we have to mobilize both uh, 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 the public and the private uh, you know sector so that we can start implementing our programs on adaptation but, but joseph is you, you refer to money is it about the availability of money or is it about pulling it together because there's enough money but and how you make it accessible which is it or is it all three Availability. I can say all of the above. <laughs> I can say all of the above because uh, our member states are really making a lot of effort. Uh -huh. They're using two percent of their GDP, you know, to 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 uh, to finance the uh, adaptation programs. Many countries in Africa are using two percent of their GDP for climate action for no uh, sure uh, sure i get change. that joseph but many people have said on the ground that actually it's a how the money is spent it's not and how it's accessed not about no, the no, amount no, no. of money the access to that money okay so we have these green funds we have all these but the access to money that's why at the african union what as i say we are really building capacity to a focal point okay. for them to elaborate proper you know bankable project okay. so that they can have access to those funds the Excellent. funds are there but access to the fund it's really, really a challenge. That's the issue. A challenge. Thank so you. Yeah. Josefa, thank you very much for, for that contribution. Um, Kadri, I'm going to come to you, back to you. You spoke about digitalization. Uh, you've got, you know, you're part of the Europe team that's looking at how we improve and uh, build better the relationship and in terms of infrastructure and access. Um, what's your response to what you've heard so far? Kadri, over to you. Uh, thank you. And I do see that... Um, that me and Jutta, uh, we both have one minute. I want to. It's okay. Uh, do, no, no, I'm, uh, going to I'm going to run over a little bit, and I say that to all of you. I'm going to run over about five minutes or so, so that we're not going to just chop you off because we want to hear to hear from all of you. So go for it, Kadri. Okay, three short comments, and first uh, of the, these is uh, that uh, I truly believe that Jutta Services, this is Director General for International Cooperation and Development. They have been uh, doing great work so far in supporting the expansion of electricity access and the energy transition in Africa. And um, they are doing so also financially. Um, 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 and I truly believe that this new approach where they will um, cooperate with um, national uh, um, governments and will find flagship projects, this will be success um, also because, um, of course, I hope that uh, lots of projects um, are covering energy sector. From our side, um, we just adopted um, um, our first ever hydrogen uh, strategy here in Europe. And we do believe that um, hydrogen, this is a um, um, way forward also uh, how we can uh, um, build up cooperation with Africa. So um, we have proposed to set out the cooperation process on renewable hydrogen with the African Union um, in the framework uh, of the um, Africa Europe Green Energy Initiative. And soon, after a couple of weeks, um, we will also um, come out with our um, EU offshore energy strategy. And, um, um, and this is, I hope, will also find common interest in uh, this area and uh, will be a good um, uh, cooperation um, between uh, Europe and Africa. Yeah. So um, I heard a criticism that uh, that maybe we are supporting too many different um, um, energy solutions, but at the same time we have to be innovative. There are sure. cleaner mm -hmm. and soon cheaper solutions. We have to well um, react according to the I, I, technical um, technical um, 
um, possibilities. Yeah. Sure, I'm going to I'm going to bring you to but the point you make about offshore, I think, is a classic example of where you could really multiply the effect of the strategy for the EU, but also doing that with the, with Africa, because offshore has the most fag fantastic opportunity to be transformative uh, across both both uh, both continents, and it's one where you could actually go it together rather than going in separate ways or in separate strategies. Yuta, if I can come to you. Um, there's a number of things that we've covered so far. <laughs> perhaps you, I know, you're thinking, my goodness. Uh, perhaps you want to kind of, let's, let's fit, d deal with the, the question from the journalist uh, about the audit report in relation to, um, is EU money being spread too thin? I think actually we can go back to that question with Vince privately and, and not to use the, the time. Oh, we only have a couple of minutes okay. here left. I, I'd like to comment. Uh, generally uh, financing because it was yeah. uh, raised uh, by the audience uh, broadly and I think there uh, because there was also a question that what EU can do in order to boost the uh, investments for the en energy sector for instance in, in Africa and I would say that the the one option uh, how to help or to be active is of course through our programming mm. so from the European Union perspective we are at the moment in the po uh, moment uh, in the point at the point where we are negotiating on the next multi-annual financial framework with the European Parliament and the Council, whenever and hopefully soon uh, the the uh, framework is adopted or approved, immediately we will start programming our development uh, cooperation funding, and uh, of course there will be some policy priorities, but I can ensure you that one of them will be green deal and uh, green transition of course the other one will be digitalization but i think that that is a topic for the next week so next week when we are going to continue our debate uh, exactly. i think we will discuss a bit more about digitalization but uh you know these two definitely will be uh, the priorities for the next programming and i think through our development cooperation uh, projects we are able to of course uh, support our african partner countries in order to uh, get more investments also to the energy sector but also for agriculture which was mentioned in the debate but then I really agree with uh, Amani that the, the role of the private sector is also crucial because, I mean, the, need, uh, the needs are so huge that we are not able to solve them only through the public funding, but, but we also need the private investments. And, of course, we also have tools uh, uh, within the European Union uh, and, of course, we have some incentives how to activate and motivate uh, private sector uh, uh, companies and, and representatives to invest uh, in Africa. But I think this is, uh, this is uh, definitely one of the topics uh, we are going to discuss in a summit uh, whenever then the summit uh, uh, will, will be held. But, uh, but green transition uh, and, of course, access to energy is, is one of the, the main uh, topics, I would say, in, in our summit. Yuta, thank you very much. And obviously you heard from people here that there's a real gender uh, dynamic here that needs to be addressed and not to be excluded. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting you would, but I think there's something about um, skirting over the issue sometimes. And I don't think any of you would, but there's a need to really eyeball where the problem lies and what their impact is going to be and where it will have the highest impact. Uh, and so I know that you'll take this on board. I want to end with Damilola. Damilola, are you still with us or have you left? I think you might have left. Are you there? No, she's gone. So I wanted to end with Damilola in terms of the points that she made. But I think that I'm going to have to end um, anyway. I've kept you. May I just say that all the questions that were sent on chat, I replied to them all individually. So please check your chat box. Amani, thank you. You are... <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm sure the other commissioners will do the same. I want to thank all of you, all five of you, for being here and spending the time and engaging with us. And I hope you continue to follow this series because it's an important one. It's the first time we're doing it. It's the first time the commission's doing it. And as Yuta said, and Yuta's commitment is that she's going to be here for every single one. So thank you very much for that, Yuta. Uh, she'll be here next week, uh, next um, uh, on the 17th, uh, where we will be, as you said, talking about digital matters and others. Continue to feed in your issues. We will record them. As you said, this is all about making sure we influence and are able to shape 
what is discussed in the summit later on this autumn, but also the future strategy. Thank you all very much for being with us and stay tuned onto our website for the next debate. And thank you all very much for being here. See you again. Take care and mind your distance. Bye bye.